I declare the 2020 Graduate School of Public Health Convocation open. Thank you for your time and attention. We begin today's program with the welcome address from our Interim Dean, Everett James. Hi, this is your Interim Dean, Everett James. I wanna extend my sincere congratulations to all of our public health graduates and graduates across the university. Welcome to the 2020 Convocation of the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. We wish we could be with you in person, but in order to limit the spread of disease, we need to maintain physical distancing. It's easy to get frustrated, but this is public health in action. Convocation is our public celebration of the achievement of you, our students, as you earn your graduate degrees. This accomplishment has no doubt required perseverance and dedication on your part. That's particularly true in these times. We welcome today those who have supported you through this endeavor, your families, your friends, and your faculty mentors and advisors. Thank you all for joining us today in support of our graduates. For you, our graduates, today marks an important transition as you begin a career dedicated to science, to the world's health, and to health equity. We know you will seize the opportunity to make a difference. Today, some of you will move on to research careers grappling with issues ranging from infectious diseases to environmental threats to the burdens of chronic disease. You may play key roles in ensuring evidence-based decision-making in public health. We challenge you to not only bring the highest professional and ethical standards to your research, but to ask yourself from the start, how can I ensure that this research will impact the public health? How can I translate this research into my colleagues in practice, to policy decision makers, and finally, to the general public? To those of you who will devote your careers to public health practice, you have a unique and privileged opportunity to directly influence people's lives for the better. In a local community, at the state level, nationally, or in our global society. My name is Lydia Tigger, former president of the Student Government Association for the Graduate School of Public Health. Um, the Craig Award for Teaching Excellence was created in 2002 through the generosity of alumnus James Craig. This year, we are delighted to present the award to Dr. John Schaefer, Assistant Professor in the Department of Human Genetics. Dr. Schaefer has been on the faculty in human genetics since 2011, serving as a teacher, advisor, and mentor. Here are just a few of the comments made by students who nominated Dr. Schaefer for the 2020 Craig Award. Dr. Schaefer is a, is a major asset to the Graduate School of Public Health. He is one of the professors most sensitive to student needs and questions, and he has the special talent for reframing even a stupid question into an interesting discussion without embarrassing anyone. If you've had a class with Dr. Schaefer, you know how much care and attention he devotes to lectures and to student learning. I still remember how great he was at explaining difficult or counterintuitive concepts with clarity, how to thoughtfully how thoughtfully he designated the class slides and homework, how he checked individually with students to be supportive, and most of all, how, he, how kind he was during all interactions with students. I can say that in addition to being one of the smartest people I know, Dr. Schaefer is also one of the most kind and most articulate, which is an incredibly rare combination in a teacher. I feel incredibly lucky to have worked with him. 
Dr. Schaefer is one of the best teachers I've had at the Graduate School of Public Health. His lectures are well organized, informative, and clear. He is excellent at articulating difficult concepts while ensuring that everyone understands his explanation of those concepts. He's also kind, encouraging, and approachable, making it obvious that he cares about his students. On behalf of the students, it is an honor to introduce Dr. Schaefer. Thank you guys for the James L. Craig Excellence in Education Award. You know, when I look at the list of past winners of this award, I see a group of people who are passionate and, and stellar educators. Uh, and I'm just so touched and excited and honored to be counted among them. You know, I would never really consider myself to be an expert educator, but you know what? I try hard and I care a lot. I care deeply about the success of my students. And, uh, and that's because I'm only your teacher for a couple years. Uh, and after that, I'm your colleague, right? So I need to make sure that I'm leaving the field of public health and my own field, human genetics, in good hands. And I'm confident that I have done that. Uh, I just want to end by saying that this award is very special to me personally. Uh, as many of you know, I myself am a graduate of Pitt Public Health and I was in your shoes and I, I nominated my own professor uh, for the James L. Craig Award because I had a deep appreciation for this person who really had a great positive impact on my education. And when uh, Dr. Candy Kammerer won the award 13 years ago, uh, I remember being in the audience and just thinking, wow, this is somebody who really does deserve this. And I'm just amazed that someone else thought that same thing about me. So I'll end by just saying thank you guys. Hello, Pitt Public Health graduates, families, and friends. It is my honor to introduce this year's convocation speaker, Bernard Goldstein, Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health and former Dean of our Graduate School of Public Health. Dr. Goldstein is a physician scientist who, as a hematologist and toxicologist, made seminal contributions to the effects of ozone, a vital criteria air pollutant, and the carcinogenesis of common hazardous agent benzene in human leukemias. He was a pioneer in establishing the field of environmental health sciences, first at New York University School of Medicine, and then at University Medicine Dentistry of New Jersey, where he established the largest environmental and occupational health program in the U.S., and simultaneously spent two years as Assistant Administrator for Research and Development at the Environmental Protection Agency underscoring his long-standing commitment to interaction of community shareholders with environmental health science and his continuing efforts at the interface of science and policy, in part codified by his contributions to the development of principles of risk assessment and communication. Indeed, among his numerous awards, including election to the American Society of Clinical Investigation and the Institute of Medicine within the National Academy of Science, he has been recognized for his founding contributions to both the Society of Toxicology and the Society of Risk Analysis. Under his leadership as our dean from 2001 to 2005, student enrollment, endowed funds, and extra research support increased markedly. The seeds for our new infrastructure were firmly established and community involvement increased greatly. Indeed, in 2005, Bernie and his wife, Professor Rosalind Carruth, turned their commitment to environmental health disparities to establish a student scholarship meant to defray costs and enhance training for public health practitioners. Dr. Goldstein's scholarly efforts and rational approaches to major public health events have spanned policy around nuclear waste disposal, managing community-based efforts in the aftermath of the deep water horizon, public health issues related to hydrofracking, and the importance of sustainability in environmental health. He continues to write scholarly articles in high-impact places such as the New England Journal of Medicine, 
highly visible op-eds, chairs numerous public health-related committees, and provides timely testimony to state and federal legislatures. Accordingly, having him share his thoughts on two existential threats, climate change and COVID-19, is certainly an inspirational moment for our graduates in all disciplines of public health. Bernie. Good afternoon. I am deeply honored to be your speaker today. Congratulations to you and to your families. You have worked hard to merit your degree and you have done so with the support of your loved ones whom I know are close to you today, at least in spirit, and also with the support of your amazing faculty. A convocation speech is supposed to be up to you. Tell a few jokes, mix together the three F's, fact, fun, and philosophy, and send you charging out into the world under the banners of Pitt and of public health. But this is not the time for upbeat. The challenges are far too serious, and your role in addressing these challenges is far too important. If you or your families ever wondered about whether a career in public health had a future, wonder no more. Dean James originally asked me to speak about global climate change. I will do that, and I will end my talk by telling you why you are different from other graduates in other Pitt schools. Unfortunately, it is not because you're going to make more money. But a public health convocation speaker in this lost springtime of the year 2020, also must speak of the tragedy of COVID-19. And one cannot speak of climate change and of emerging infections without considering how they both are multipliers of health inequity, of social justice and racial justice. My talk will use an old fashioned pedagogic tool, one familiar to you since grade school. Think back of all the essay assignments or exam questions which began, compare and contrast. I'll try to do that for COVID-19 and climate change. They obviously differ in their cores, but let's go beyond that. First, they are dreadfully similar in lost opportunities for prevention. I was in charge of science at EPA when we received our first funding for what was then called global warming. That was 35 years ago. Since then, the inexorable changes in climate have just been just as predicted or worse. And we are only finally recognizing the public health impacts which are accelerating. Also expected was a global emerging infection hitting Pittsburgh, as was its linkage to the broader environmental issue of the increasing interaction of humans with wild animals. Some of you may remember the slides I would show at the beginning of my general lectures on environmental health, describing how overfishing off the west coast of Africa led to more bushmeat hunting, more interaction with primates, and risk of emerging infections. In 2004, at the Global, at the Graduate School of Public Health, we were the site of a workshop of the United Nations Environmental Program on the role of environment in emerging infections. And Dean Burke, who was a world leader in the field, believes that major emerging infections will become even more frequent. Yet we have not been well prepared. Climate change and emerging infections are also similar in the role played by increased population. Global population has more than doubled from the first Earth Day in 1970. About half the forcing function for climate change is population growth, which also contributes to our overloading nature with our wastes. And COVID-19 has certainly spread more quickly. Both COVID-19 and climate change are also similar in the role plays by the loss of resilience, the loss of buffering power. In the 1800s, almost all the trees from Pittsburgh west to Illinois were cut down with little impact, if any, on global climate. Doing the same now in the Amazon will have substantial global climate contract con consequences due to the loss of our planetary buffering power capacity. Deaths due to COVID-19 also reflect a loss of resilience in the case of individual humans. Us old folks just don't make 
into antibodies like we used to, and our lung reserve decreases with normal aging, as does the reserve, the buffering power of other of our organs. Of course, a difference between the two threats is that humans are reproducible. Our planet is not. My original notes for this talk focused on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I've narrowed the anecdotes in that period down to just a few, which I believe have lessons for today. What I remember most about teaching at the first day of Earth Day are the four attendees who walked out in disgust. They wanted to abolish the chemical industry and use just natural products. I had responded by saying that I went, when I went camping with my family, I would bring pharmaceuticals and other industry products to protect them. That argument is still with us. Too many of us believe that synthetic chemicals are inherently evil and natural chemicals are all good. Is that a problem? As just one example, what difference does it make that food grown from genetically modified seeds is, if anything, safer than food grown from seeds developed through standard practices? Perhaps it means nothing, if your society is rich enough not to need cheaper foods. Perhaps nothing if global climate change and the economic impact of emerging infections and other unforeseen issues does not lead to hunger and malnutrition, particularly in developing countries. And perhaps nothing if the same pressures that cause new microbes to affect humans do not lead to mutations that affect food sources. So how can we advocate throwing away a very valuable tool like genetic modification for reasons that almost have almost as little scientific justification as climate denial or refusing vaccination? Our loss of planetary resilience means that mistakes are less affordable. We in public health need to better defend our science as a decision tool, particularly related to the inevitable trade-offs in choosing among options, few of which are risk-free. An example from today, it is fashionable to be against nuclear power. Even the far-reaching New Green Deal proposal never mentions nuclear power, despite the fact that nuclear now provides about half of America's carbon-free electricity. A major concern about nuclear power, appropriately, is radioactive waste. Storage in a repository in Nevada was turned down because it might begin to slowly leak radiation 100 years from now. But this worst case scenario leads to one additional death of cancer in the entire 22nd century. Between now and then, probably millions will die due to the broad ravages of global climate change that could have been prevented by keeping nuclear power going, at least until other carbon-free sources can fully take over. We need to think across usual boundaries and to be willing to make tough science-based decisions in which health is central. My last anecdote. Our 1970 Clean Air Act led to increased oil use to replace coal. In 1973, the crisis caused by the Arab oil embargo led the coal industry to argue that replacing American oil with Arab, American coal rather, with Arab oil was a bad idea. President Nixon's Office of Management and Budget had a meeting on the issue at which I spoke about the health effects of air pollutants. When I said that infants were affected, I was interrupted by a White House economist who asked if it was girl infants or boy infants. I'm not making this up. He explained that economically, the average American female costs more to raise and support than she contributed, at least in 1973, to the gross domestic product. Why tell you this? One hopes that we are at least mostly past such flagrant anti-feminism. I tell you this because we are not past the underlying assumption of White House economists that our economy is more important than our well-being. And it's not just the debates on COVID-19 reopening or the cost of preventing climate change. It is about the preventive portions of the Affordable Care Act and too many other examples. We have come far in focusing on metrics such as years of potential life loss and disability-adjusted life years. But we still have far to go to provide metrics for human well-being and for the natural environment that can compete with a dollar sign. 
A contrast between COVID-19 and climate change can be found in residential sprawl, which contributes to the outsized U.S. contribution to climate change. Sprawl makes us dependent on automobiles and uses up green space. Sprawl is good, in contrast, for COVID-19, because social distancing is important. Russell and I live in Oakland, which, except for the UPMC area, is now a ghost town. We see almost no one when we leave to shop or walk or take out the garbage. But people living in the area of the Bronx that I grew up in are crowded together. They need to share elevators or stairwells to get outside and are disproportionately being called on to perform risky work in support of essential services. So it is no surprise that the Bronx has a very high rate of COVID-19 infections deaths and that living in crowded, low-income housing in disadvantaged neighborhoods is a national magnifier for COVID-19. But all of the proposals to help effective individuals and community, has anyone heard of using population density as a metric to determine the extent of federal support? Why not? Let me build on the centrality of focusing a disadvantaged population to describe another challenge, but not to a disadvantaged community. In public health, we, provide, we pride ourselves on listening to the community and to credit what they tell us. We have progressed in evaluating the inclusion of minority voices and of women within the public health workforce, including in leadership positions. We still have a long way to go. Uh, I'm one of the all-white male deans of this Graduate School of Public Health. But think of it. Which group of Americans are most underrepresented in terms of relative numbers of public health professionals? How about Republicans? Americans who generally are more conservative than the vast majority of the public health workforce. To move forward, we must be able to listen respectably, respectfully and must be willing to fashion our rationale for needed public health interventions in ways that credit these views which, whether manipulated by demagogues or not, are largely based on a considered interpretation of the U.S. Constitution and of this nation's role in the world. To be politically effective, we need to stop talking just to ourselves. Remember, we learned long ago that people opposed to vaccination do not do so because they are stupid. And we also learned that treating them as if they are stupid does not help to change our mind. We in public health, with our roots in biology, also understand that there are biological and cognitive foundations built into the human brain, which often underlay parochial viewpoints, the nationalism and regionalism that makes it so difficult to respond to global threats such as climate change and emerging infections. Would those who wrote our Constitution have left these two global issues to our individual states? Senator Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, called for an amendment to incorporate the environment into our constitutional rights. Perhaps health should be there as well. I promise to end by talking about what differentiates you from other graduates. I've today focused on transboundary issues. As part of your graduate education, you are required to have at least an introduction to five very different areas of public health science and practice behavioral health sciences, biostatistics, environmental health, epidemiology, and health management and practice. The, these core disciplines involved at departmental levels are broader than for any school on this campus except for the Faculty of Arts and Science, but there is no need for the Faculty of Arts and Science to inter have interaction between the French department and the physics department. However, no major public health problem can be prevented or solved by any one of our academic disciplines working alone. Thinking and acting across the broad range of academic boxes that describe your public health education and working with other disciplines as well is central to solving present and future, and future public health problems. To help you do so, you have been given the breadth to think across disciplines and the foundation necessary to continue to learn much more. Please, go out and do it, with the grateful thanks of all of us and the sure knowledge that you will be making a difference. Bless you all. 
Today's convocation program honors those graduates who earned their degrees in 2019 and 2020, which includes graduates from last June, August, and December, as well as the April 2020 graduates. We are awarding over 260 degrees this year. Dr. Martha Terry, Associate Professor of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences, will recognize the names of the candidates for degrees. Good afternoon and welcome to our April 2020 convocation for the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. We are delighted you can join us today to celebrate all the wonderful young people who are graduating and those who have graduated. I am so happy to be announcing their names today and I wanna share with families out there that I've had many of these students in my classes and I can tell you they are wonderful young people who are gonna make a difference in this world. All right, let's get started. In the Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences, for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Sarah Bowman. Jonathan Raviota. Cynthia Salter. For the degree of Master of Public Health in BCHS, Lindsay Bell. Julie Brewer. Amanda Carpenter. Allison Decker. Jennifer Enriquez, Ashley Gallo, Adriana Gratisek, Caroline Harple, Jessica Hessler, Emily Clausen, Hannah Kupitz, Michael Latati, Lisa Letterer, Elise Littleberry, Yanni Mains Mason, Hannah Makarevich, Zachary Michaels, Cassandra Nedley, Caitlin Powers, Carolyn Prutting, John Reese, Lauren Risser, Daniel Shabnitsky, Nanina Sexton, and Kayla Warren. In the Department of Biostatistics, for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Biostatistics, Tian Yu Deng. Huang Lin. M. Tanbin Raman. Tao Sun. Che Xuan. Jun Zhang For the degree of Master of Science in Biostatistics Kaylee Adamson Kendra Bobby Christina Boyd Kelly Cahill Chandler Caps, Shang Zhen Chen, 
Richard Cuddy, Graham Cummins, Jennifer Fedor, Annie Guo, Zin Han Lee, Elijah Lovelace, Raytheon Liu, Jason Mall, Priyanka Seti, Ruopu Song, Meng Si Wang, Yun Fei Shi, Jie Yao, Jian Hui Zhu. In the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, for the degree of Doctor of Public Health in EOH, Kristen Frawley. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in EOH, Teresa Anguiano. Rahel Biru. Shuo Sof. Travis Lear. Jiaxin Liu Antonella Morocco Amrita Sahu Cody Wolf For the degree of Master of Public Health in EOH Jessica Albrecht Michaela Kerr Samantha Totoni For the Master of Science degree in EOH Devin Boyles, Tongzwei Gu, and Yi Liu. In the Department of Epidemiology, for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Shalkar Adambekov. Henley Brownwright, Chen Di Tui, Kyle Freeze. Guru Rajas Jami, Sharon Renner, Curtis Tilvis, Mary Winger. Ling Shu Shui Lei Zhu
for the degree of Master of Public Health in Epidemiology, Guy Agostinelli. Hannah Allen. Hiba Anwar. Ashlyn Bolas. Carlia Carpia. Margaret Carr. Gabrielle Corona. Sarah D. Perior. Jennifer Alil. Walter Mark Greenhalch. Brandon Herbert. Arshad Khalid. Sarah Martin. Madeline Mason. Alexa Meinhardt. Sajal Mystery. Sarah Morgan. Taylor Paglisati. Kathleen Shedlock. Hina Siddiqui. Julia Yudkovitz. For the degree of Master of Science in Epidemiology, Michelle Clifton, Harris E.K.K., Michael Gennardi, Allison Kohler, Gretchen Sway. In the Department of Health Policy and Management, for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Mara Hollander. Tumater Kuja. Ilinka Nethes. Raymond Van Cleve. For the degree of Master of Public Health in Health Policy and Management, Morgan Benner. Kieran Borkar. Jordan Bullock. Kaishin Chen. Mary Kathleen Duncan, Krista Gobelny Ebert, Jesse Helfer, Troy Lyons, Caitlin Saul Ridpath, Heather Tomko. For the degree of Master of Science in Health Policy and Management, Terry Newman and Alvaro San Juan Rodriguez. For the degree of Master of Health Administration in Health Policy and Management, Ilham Abdi. Jennifer Andrews. Caleb Bahana. Justin Benkowski. Elizabeth Bourne. Chandler Caulfield, Erica Garrison, Emily Joseph, Victoria Cully, Terence Michael Aranyas Litam, Sydney Pack, Ritambara Pathak, William Powell. Megan Pretty, Catherine Robert Shaw, John Ann Ross, Katerina Shabalov, Lydia Tigert, Myra Undavali, Michael Whalen, Deborah 
Wopita. Zach Zambrano. In the Department of Human Genetics, for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Jason Carson. Megan Gliozzi. Kathyaini Gopal Krishna. Bruce Nazy. Nandini Ramesh. Emily Russell. Andrew Sinsheimer. For the degree of Master of Public Health in Human Genetics, Victoria Bacon. Stephanie Betts. Sarah Brunker. Megan Honig. Jody Kutzner, Claire McDonald, Marilyn No, Friedel Patel, Natasha Robin Berman, Charlotte Skinner, Pujar Solanke, Jessica Tyner, and Lauren Winter. For the degree of Master of Science in Human Genetics, Annie Arakiaraj, Ling Ling Chen, Anushe Munir, Morgan Sedorovitz, Fan Long Tran, Kelly Urbanek. For the degree of Master of Science in Genetic Counseling, Alyssa Acevedo, Victoria Bacon, Stephanie Betts, Kelsey Bonnert, Caroline Baum, Sarah Brunker, Christine Drogan, Allison Evans, Andrew Faisenbaker, Megan Honig, Ashley Lahr, Claire McDonald, Sarah McGee, Natasha Robin Berman, Charlotte Skinner, Pujar Solanke, Caitlin Sullivan, Rosemarie Veneer, and Lauren Winter. In the Department of Infectious Diseases and Microbiology, for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Henry Ma. and Jacob Richards. For the degree of Master of Public Health in Infectious Diseases and Microbiology, Samira Amarova, 
Cheyenne Anarumo, Megan Arden, Laura Dietert, Brianna Edison, Lauren Fogelman, Rachel Jaffe, Jibordi Kamasa Kwashi, Megan Kerbaj, Brian Kimball, Katherine Leiden, Monica Nelson, Mariana Ortiz, Injid Osiris, Elizabeth Owens, Omar Rahman, Abigail Rubio, Sonia Subnis, Jessica Salerno, Rajiv Salunke, Sean Saul, Victoria Schmalstig, Georgie Scott, Kelsey Simon, Quinn Solomon, Sarah Sullivan, Andrew Whaley. For the degree of Master of Science in Infectious Diseases and Microbiology, Byron Charon, Victoria Gould, Gwendolyn Kettenberg, Zachary Koenig, Emily Olson, Carson Shoger, Katrina Stevenson, Subramanian Thothathri, Michael Yi, Jason Young. In the Department of Multidisciplinary Masters for the degree of the Multidisciplinary Masters degree, Yamira Bell, David Gorski, Marin Kang, Jeremy Landeo Gutierrez, Ki Pum Lee, Karen Lin, Roland Massad, Sang Ki Oak, Azade Rize, Devin Rogers, Sarah Safdari Sadalu, Ariel Snell, Erica Stevens, Emily Transu, Kavita Vinaker, Simon Johannes, and Young Yu. Congratulations to everyone. Go out and do good work. This is Peter Salk, and I am delighted to be able to be with you today to extend congratulations for your graduation from Pitt Public Health. It's been an extraordinary opportunity for you to be undertaking studies related to the, the most important field of public health, and the events that are taking place today certainly emphasize the value and the importance of what you have chosen as your own directions, your own professions. There's a great history at the University of Pittsburgh, so many different contributions to health, to medicine, to the health sciences, to public health. And my father, of course, had the opportunity to um, take part in all of that during work on the polio vaccine back in the 1940s and the 1950s. And that tradition has continued with great strength up through today. 
The unfortunate situation of the coronavirus pandemic has changed everyone's lives around the world and certainly has been an extraordinary disruption in terms of the ordinary day-to-day -day progress of our lives. And yet, at the same time, it serves perhaps as a reminder to the public of the importance of what you have chosen to do, the emphasis you've chosen for your own lives. It's so easy to forget and to have public health sort of fall into the background of one's awareness, but the, the events today have just made it impossible not to be aware of what is so important for all of us in, li in, in our lives. And each of you, in your own areas of specialization, through the, the seven different departments at, um, at Pitt Public Health, each one has so direct a relevance to this present situation. So without going into, into details about how each of your disciplines relates to the present time, uh, I just wanted to say to you how proud I am to be associated with, with you, with this school, and to send, to send my own wishes for um, a, a speedy transition to a more normal situation and that each of you will be able to carry into your own lives and into the future the great wealth of, of, of experience and understanding that you've gained during your time at Pitt Public Health. So from me to you and with the great history that, li that underlies all of this, um, Congratulations, and do well, and enjoy the, the next period ahead. Those attracted to the field of public health must hold a unique set of skills and traits. Public health professionals and researchers must be outstanding academicians and researchers, and they must also care deeply about their fellow human beings and community. Although the diplomas we've awarded have only the graduate's name on them, perhaps they should all have a footnote as well. A thank you to all of you who have supported your students during this difficult time and helped them achieve their goals. Hi, we thank the parents, grandparents, spouses, partners, family and friends who supported our graduates. It's a unique moment in public health history. We hope you know how much we appreciate you all. While this year's graduation is a challenge, you will always be the special coronavirus class. You now have the skills and training to deal with this public health crisis and to make a real difference in the world. Go forth and hail to Pitt. I declare the 2020 Graduate School of Public Health convocation closed. Our departments will now begin their celebrations. We invite our graduates and their guests to continue watching as the programs will begin shortly.